hard to figure out that I'm not Todd Hancock. Uh, when I heard what Todd was teaching on, questions I've been asked, I couldn't help but reflect over the years that I've been working with the church and questions that I've been asked too, so I started going through my mind different things that I've been asked over time. Whenever um, a teacher can't be here for whatever reason, I usually get a phone call and they'll say, hey, I'm not going to be able to be there. I've asked so-and-so, and we kind of have a little list that they pick from. And, um, and generally, the person just teaches what they want to teach. It doesn't go along with the subject matter. But when Todd called me to tell me he wasn't going to be here on Wednesday, he said, but I've got two requests. I'm not going to be here, but I've got two requests. And I said, okay, what are they? What's the first one? He said, I want you to teach the class. And I said, well, okay, I'll do that. And he said, the second one is, I don't want you to teach anything you want. I want you to stick to the subject that we have. And so, you know, that's hard for me to do anyway, stick to the subject. So I thought, okay, Todd, but give me some thoughts. And he says, no, you, you pick what you want to talk about. So I thought through my mind real quick, and I said, what's some questions that I've been asked? And there were two overwhelming questions that I get asked constantly. Sometimes by our own members, but most of the time by others. If, an own, if one of our own members asks me the question, they'll say it this way. Do we really think we're the only ones going to heaven? If somebody from the denominational world asks me that, they'll say, do you all really think you're the only ones going to heaven? I'm not even going to touch that question. That's not the one I'm going to speak about today. But that's one of the two questions I get asked a lot, and uh, I'll save that. If he asks me, Jerry, if he asks me another time to teach, I'll do that one. All right. The one I get asked all the time, you all probably know it, is why does the Church of Christ not use instruments in your worship service? So that's the one we're going to look at today. Some questions are fair. I think that's a fair question. I don't think there's anything wrong with that question. Being, I don't mind being asked that question. Now, they're not going to like the answer I give, but I don't mind being asked the question. I, I think it's a fair question. I think the other question that I made mention of is a fair question to ask also. There are unfair questions to ask, like about a year ago, I had a man working in my yard on the sprinkler system. He was a member of the Assembly of God. I'll just tell you what it was. I'm not being critical. I'm just telling you that's what he was a member of, the Assembly of God. And he said to me, you know, what's the difference between the Assembly of God and Churches of Christ? And my answer to that question was, I couldn't tell you what the difference is between the Assembly of God and Churches of Christ. His response to that was, every Church of Christ person I ask says the exact same thing. And I said, well, okay, you tell me what's the difference between the assembly of God and churches of Christ. And he said, well, I can't answer that because I don't know anything about churches of Christ. And I said, well, bingo, I can't answer that either because I don't know anything about the assembly of God. Now, if I want to take the time to do some research on the assembly of God, I told him, I said, I can assure you I can come up with some differences between the assembly of God and churches of Christ. But that's an unfair question to ask because he has just as much responsibility to, and when he asks a question like that to ask to research what churches of Christ are as I would have to research what assemblies of God is. So those are the two questions, though. Do you? And generally, it's not stated. Why do churches of Christ not use the instruments? Generally, it's stated, why do you all not believe in music? And we do believe in music, don't we? Yeah, it's just not instrumental music in the worship that we uh, participate in. Singing is a very important part of the worship. We as members of the Lord's body 
want to sing, but we want to sing in an acceptable way to God. So in order to do that, we need all of us, no matter what religion you are, we need to turn to God's word to find the answer or instructions. So what does God's word say about singing? I don't think there's a religious group in the world today, at least affiliated in some way with Christianity, that doesn't sing in their worship service. I don't know of one that does that. In other words, we all sing. We do this because we're commanded to do it. Our singing doesn't have to be perfect, and often it's not. Our singing doesn't have to be pretty, and when I do it, it's not. But it is a commandment to do. Having said all of that, I can assure you God wants us to sing in our worship service to him. And it's just as important as the preaching of a sermon, the leading of a prayer, the Lord's Supper, or the offering. The debate isn't if we sing, but rather how we sing to God. We in Churches of Christ, generally speaking, sing a cappella. The issue of a cappella music versus instrumental music is as old as <laughs> it goes way back, way back into um, the 1800s. The truth of the matter is that even if I do the greatest job and if I was invited to come, as my father was, to a denominational church, and speak to that church regarding this issue because the church asked him to come because they wanted to know if they were worshiping correctly. That's the way it was presenting, presented to him. So he went and talked to that congregation. He did a fantastic job when he talked to them, but not a mind was changed when he finished that. Still yet, we're commanded to teach. I might not change one person's mind. Possibly in this auditorium, I haven't really looked around that much, but possibly there's a visitor here. Maybe they're from the denominational world. And maybe they wondered this very fact. Well, maybe this lesson will help you better understand. Um, I also realize that by and large, all of us, to a certain degree, are going to agree with the things that are said here today. But over the years, these are some of the things that I have uh, encountered. Uh, first, before we do that, though, let's focus in on some verses in the Bible that talk about singing. Colossians 3.16. That's the one we always go to. We've kind of worn it out in a good way uh, whenever we're talking about it. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. This is verse 16. With all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thanksgiving in your heart to God. That's one we usually go to. Uh, I just read it to you, but let's look at Ephesians 5.19. This is the one I'm going to use more than Colossians 3.16. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Now, I'm going to read it one more time. Ephesians 5.19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. I think it's a shame that many of us do not sing whenever we have the opportunity in our assemblies. I wish we all would sing and mean those words that we're singing. There's a lot of reason, I think, for our inactivity, but I don't think those really hold much water. Uh, I've joked with you about it, but I'm, I'm not the best singer. But I sing. But there are times when I, for whatever reason, have something else in my mind. If I'm going to preach, maybe I'm thinking about that. And you all are singing and I'm sitting down here not singing. 
But almost always when that happens, there's a little verse to a song that will pop into my mind. I'll think, ooh, I'm not singing. I need to do that. And then I'll think of these words. Let those refuse to sing. Finish it for me. Who never knew the Lord or our God. All right? Let, now think about that. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our Lord. I can guarantee you this. I know the Lord, and I know you know Him. And so, no matter how bad it sounds, I'm going to sing. There's reasons for that. God likes it. God has asked us to do it. As bad as I might, might sound to me, or to the people sitting around me, it sounds pretty good to Him if I'm doing it with, in the truth of His Word and with the right spirit as I'm singing. So I think we need to get over that. I think we need to get over the fact that maybe we don't sound exactly perfect whenever we sing. We have some people that will make up for my lack of ability. All right? And I try to sit as close to those people as I can most of the time. It helps me. So we just kind of need to wade through that and understand we're not doing this for us. We're doing this for God. God has asked us to sing, and it's just as important as, as any of the other acts of worship that we can do. And God is not pleased if we omit any of those from our worship service. So we need to understand that we need to be involved in this act. Romans 15, 9 through 11. He, uh, Paul's talking to the Gentiles here. He's talking about God's mercy. He says, Therefore I will give praise to thee among the Gentiles. I will sing to thy name. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all of the people praise him. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. What is the outcome then? I shall sing with the Spirit, not the Holy Spirit, I shall sing with the right attitude. I shall sing with the spirit, and I shall sing with the mind also. James 5.13 Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone among you cheerful? Let him praise. Sing praises. All right? So there's many other scriptures that we could look at. We've looked at just a few here about singing. But also understand that as you sing, you're worshiping God. So when we sing a song of praise like praise him, praise him, we need to understand that's who we're singing to. We're singing to God. Praise God, praise God. We sing songs of glorification. To God be the glory. We sing songs of fellowship and love. Love lifted me. We have songs that are meant to evangelize, seeking the lost. We have songs that help us center our thoughts on worship, O oh, worship the King. We have songs that help us understand how to be a servant, such as victory in Jesus. All of those songs help teach us and motivate us. Now, I can't tell you how many times I have sat in one of the pews while the song leader was leading a certain song, and a phrase in that song pricked my heart. Whether it's victory in Jesus or whether it's one of these other ones I mentioned, there's a phrase in there that taught me, and that's what it's about. We're teaching each other through these songs that we're singing. And it may be true, we don't sing exactly the way they did back in the first century. It was more of a chant than four-part harmony like we have today. That may be true, but as they did that back then, they were teaching one another. And as we sing our songs today, we are teaching each other. And when you're motivated, and I know of people who sit in a pew and during the invitation song, uh, one of the verses was led, and it made them, it motivated them to take that step out and come down to the front to be baptized or to ask for forgiveness. Because whenever they came down, that's what they said. That's the reason they gave for coming down. 
Songs are meant to admonish us and teach us, and that's what they do. Now, Richard has told us that time and time again. Myron has told us that time and time again. I'm not going to break into a song right now and sing it for you, because I don't want you all to, to cringe. But I wish Myron or Richard was here right now where they uh, could do that, uh, because um, uh, it, it motivates. It motivates uh, the audience. Remember, though, the question really isn't are we to sing or not, but rather how are we to sing? And perhaps more to the point, does it matter how we sing? A cappella or instrumental? I believe it does matter, so let's go over a few of the points here. All of these points, four or five of them, are not meant to hurt anybody's feelings or any of that. These were statements actually made by somebody who believed it's okay to sing with the instrument. And then I have a response to each of those statements. So the first one is, this is a man who thinks it's all right to use the instrument. He said it is tradition and not the Bible that says the use of an instrument while singing to God during our worship is wrong. After all, David played a harp while singing to God. Now, I'm going to stop there for a minute. Is that the truth of God's word? Yes. Don't try to argue with that. David played a harp while singing to God. The instrument was used by Israel on occasion to worship God. Is that true? Yes. Okay. It was found in the temple. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Even in the New Testament, references are made to the instrument being used by angels. Is that true? At least in symbolic language, it is, isn't it? Uh, in heaven. The culture of the first century permitted it. The only reason, this is the man talking, the only reason it should not be used today, now here, we're going to have a difference here, is if a particular culture doesn't allow it to be used. The radical ministry of Jesus allowed for the instrument. Jesus even said, stop looking at the fine points and worship from your heart. We then should be free from legalistic rules. If our heart tells us that it is okay to use the instrument, then we should be at liberty to use it. The important thing to remember here is that if we are worshiping God with a good conscience, then your worship will be acceptable. All right, I'm going to open the floor up. I'm just going to read the scriptures. I think the word was about the symbol, what has the soul of God, the soul of the spirit to sing to God. I can't, it's, that's not, but I can't quote it, but I just read it recently, and I don't remember where it is. But it talks about the instrument is a dead, is dead, but the body of the soul living for singing to God. Okay. Whenever we understand that uh, David was playing his harp to God, he was probably by himself. Whenever these instruments are used and and used, I mean, I've got a grandson that's in the Church of Christ with an instrument right now, and. What they're doing is they're entertaining with the instruments. And that's why I think God wanted us to use our voices to worship Him, not to entertain the audience. I was raised in the Baptist church where we had a choir, we had solo singers and everybody bragged about the solo singer did such a wonderful job but what she was doing was entertaining us. Okay, anybody else? No. Yeah. Go ahead. If I remember correctly just as David was pointing out David played the harp Praise God. He was not in a worship service. And I do not believe, if I remember correctly, again, when this 
had the synagogue services on the Sabbath, or when they actually the priests would go in to do the, the worship. They weren't necessarily, they weren't using an instrument then. Synagogue did, but the temple did from the outside of the building to call people into the building. Say that whatever my heart thinks is right, then why do I need to be here? My heart might say, I think it's fine if I stay home. Mm -hmm. I'm right with God. So you're wasting my time. Yeah. Um, let's look at that for just a second. So you had Saul of Tarsus. And he stood there when Stephen was stoned, gave his approval to that. He wreaked havoc on the church. He went about all over arresting people that were Christians, pulling them out. And I'm telling you, he thought he was doing the right thing. It wasn't no, you know, if I find out differently, I'm still going to do this because I think it's the right thing. He had a heart that was willing to change, but he thought he was doing the right thing. He said, I did it all with what? A clear conscience. I did it all with a clear conscience. Now, was he right just because his conscience was clear? He himself called, he called himself the chief of sinners because of what he had done. So he didn't think it was right. He thought he was wrong eventually. But he didn't know it at that time. He did it with a clear conscience. Who in here would think that when Cain and Abel made their sacrifice, this is an Old Testament story here. So Cain and Abel are told what to offer. Abel does exactly what God says to do. It is believed that Cain looked at the situation and said, what I do is just as good as what he does, and so I'm going to offer what I do. Now, we don't know exactly how all that played out. But if he did that, he probably did that with a clear conscience. If he didn't, you have the example of Nadab and Abihu in the Bible. Two Levitical priests. Sons of Aaron? All right, two Levitical priests, Nadab and Abihu. They're told what to offer, so they, go, they get that animal, they do them right so far. They're told, okay, once you have slain the beast and all of that, then go get fire from over there. Now, I don't know where the over there was, but God specifically said, go and get fire from this particular place. Nadab and Abihu, with a clear conscience, got fire from over here. And fire is fire. And so they were immediately killed for doing that. God struck them down for doing that. The clear conscience thing doesn't mean a whole lot to me. Because I want to do it exactly the way God asked me to do it. And if I do it that way, I should have a clear conscience for doing that. But if somebody can come up with a scripture in here that points me in a different direction, then I would want to do it the way God said to do it. I can't find it in here. So that's one case study. Yeah. And you threw out a lot of stuff there as you were going. But this old argument about, well, you're legalistic, is to me a real cop out. If I want to do what God says, I don't want to add to or take away from his book, as he says in Deuteronomy 4 or in Revelation 21. Don't do these things. How does that make me legalistic just because I want to do what he says? They're trying to find some kind of way to put the person down. Legalism means you're trying your best to follow the law exactly. And so I don't think there's anything wrong with that on matters of faith. On matters of opinion, we need to have a more open mind on things where God hasn't said specifically how to do something. 
But I think he has said here specifically how to do something. Here's the second argument, because if we don't move along, we're going to run out of time. The word melody comes from the Greek word solo, P-S-A-L-L-O, solo. Some have translated this word to mean make harmony. This is the person making the argument. But some suggest that the word means to pluck as if you were plucking an instrument. This line of reasoning is extended to include that nowhere in the New Testament does the Bible instruct us to use unleavened bread in the Lord's Supper. But we do this without hesitation. Often we will say, well, we use unleavened bread in the Lord's Supper because when Jesus instituted it at Passover, that would have been the bread that he was using at that time. Therefore, today, that's why we use it. If you use this type of rationale, then the same argument could be used from the usage of instru instrumental music as we sing to God because it was used in the Old Testament. Therefore, when we're told to sing in the New Testament, it goes without reasoning that we have the right if we want to use the instrument. Well, my response to that is this. The word solo in the New Testament does not mean to pluck. It does not mean that. It means to sing to. However, think about this for just a moment. If the word did mean to pluck, then what is the instrument that God has told us to pluck? It was not a Les Paul guitar, all right? It's in the scripture. What is it? The heart is what is to be plucked. It is obvious from the text that the instrument which God is asking us to pluck, if that was the meaning, would be the heart. Or, in other words, you mean these words that you're singing. Yes. Uh, it, it seems to me, too, that God has made it really easy for all of us to not have any excuse not to worship. I mean, we don't need a building or any place to go to that tree. All of us can sing. We made it just real simple. Simple. A simple solution. But I do find it curious why so many other congregations, it's mainly preachers who have masters, PhDs, everything. They study the Bible, hopefully just the Bible, and somehow they come to a different conclusion. Uh, what what those folks would say, not the average Congress uh, member of the churches, but what the... And you know, not, what, what would Dr. Dyke say about right. it? Right. It's not just the instrument that we would have differences on, right? I mean, there's several things that are different. Why does that person with a PhD say it's all right to use the word pastor referring to the minister and us over here with the, those that have PhD saying no God says it this way um, it is interesting to to try to figure all, all of that out uh, to me let me let me read these things and maybe maybe it'll help I'll just go ahead and skip back over here to the back so here's a man with a PhD he's um, his name is John Spencer Kerwin. He's from the Church of England, one of the first churches. The Catholic Church was the first organized religion to bring in the instrument right around 900 or so uh, A.D. The Church of England wasn't all that far behind when it brought an instrument in, uh, well, a few centuries later. John Spencer Kerwin's a historian for the Church of England. And he says this, in 1911, he said this, Men still living can remember the time when organs were very seldom found outside the Church of England. So he's saying our religion used them. He didn't mention the Catholics, but they used them also. But the Methodists, the Independents, the Baptists rarely had them in their worship service. And the Presbyterians never had them in their worship service. That's written in 1911. Roman Catholics. James W. McKinnon. He's a historian, not for Churches of Christ, speaking about the Catholic Church. He's a historian for the Catholic Church. McKinnon wrote his dissertation 
1965 at Columbia University. He wrote it on the church fathers and the musical instrument. What we mean by church fathers is those that came, leaders of the church, that came right after the apostles. So you had men like Polycarp and Clement of Rome and all of those people that you can read about if you want to study early church history. The, second, the end of the first century, the beginning of the second century, all the way through to the third or so century. All right, this is what he wrote. In his research, he says that not only did the church fathers oppose the use of the instrument. I, I just have to stop there for a second and say, these are men held in high regard, these church fathers. All right. Not only did they oppose it, but they forbade it, forbade it from being used. Adam Clark, I have his commentaries in my office. I often refer to them. He's a Methodist, was a Methodist. And I refer to them frequently. A very intelligent man. I wouldn't agree with everything he said, but there was a lot of things I would agree with. And some of the things that he and I would agree with, the religion that he was associated with, would not agree with him anymore on those things. No, he said, the whole spirit so and genius of the Christian, Christian religion are against this, and that this is the instrument. And those who know the church of God best and what constitutes its genuine spiritual state know that these things have been introduced as a substitution for the life and power of religion. And that where they prevail most, the instrument, there is least of the power of Christianity. Away with such babblings from the worship of the infinite spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, who requires his followers to worship him in spirit and in truth. For to no such worship are those instruments friendly. That's not from a member of the church. That's from a well-known, highly sought-after speaker way back when by the name of Adam Clark the very founder of the Methodist Church, John Wesley, and his brother Charles. They were in agreement on this. Here's his quote. I have no objection to the instrument of music in our chapels, provided they are never seen or never heard. All right, so you ever hear the name Charles Spur Spurgeon? Charles Spurgeon is a famous Baptist preacher. My cousin is a Baptist minister. My cousin has quoted Charles Spur Spurgeon to me on multiple occasions about other matters. So I've got this here. I'm ready to go when next time we talk. All right. I love him. He's, he's near and dear to me. You see, it says, um, It is the most singing is the most delightful part of worship. It comes nearest to the adoration of heaven. What a degradation to supplant the intelligent song, David, you were saying this a minute ago, of the whole congregation by the theatrical prettiness of a quartet, the redefined niceties of a choir, or the blowing off of the wind from an inanimate bellows of pipes. We might as well pray by machinery as praised by it. I would say he would be against it. All right? John Calvin, the founder of the Presbyterian Church. Musical instruments in celebrating the praise of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting of lamps, and the restoration of the shadows of the law. Again, he's against it. A Baptist historian, David and minister, David Benedict. I don't know, in the 1800s, I don't know if you all realize that the Baptist church was at odds with the Catholic church and they did battle and they did it for a long, long time. They did not like each other, religiously speaking. Staunch old Baptist, he says, would have sooner tolerated the Pope of Rome in their pulpits as an organ in their galleries. 
So they would not have invited the Pope to speak at one of their assemblies and no more than they would have an instrument in their worship service. So my question would be, what happened? Why did all these smart guys, how did they get it all wrong and these other group of people got it all right, according to them? The world at, that, at one time it worshipped without the instrument. All the way up until the Catholics introduced it in 900 or 1000 A.D. By the way, they introduced it before that, and the membership rose up in the Catholic Church and said, we don't want this. And they did away with it for 200 years and then brought it back little by little, and it, and it took hold, and by 1000 it was within the worship service. So there was a time that it wasn't there, and then later there's a time that it is introduced, and little by little it does take hold, and we do have it. I don't know if that helps Dan with the, the question or not, but these are smart people. It's not, it's not like only one side has the smart people and everybody else doesn't. Yeah. Let me say a couple of things. First, if I understand right, when you get a PhD, that dissertation is usually on one topic. Mm -hmm. Is that not correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that means that guy's supposed to be smart on one topic. Doesn't mean he knows anything about anything else. Now, I'm not putting him down, he may be extremely smart. But when I look at this book and I see the men that translated this from the Greek into English. Okay? Obviously, they were very smart on dealing with translations and moving these words. If that's the case, and they would have wanted us to play an instrument, why then in Ephesians 5.19 would it not say, speaking to one another, instead it should say, playing for one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, playing and making melody in your heart. Or, they didn't do that. Or why doesn't it say singing with an instrument? Yeah. Yeah. And and making melody in your heart. There does say that that solo was plucked. Now it also meant pluck the hairs of the beard as well as pluck, but when we know that it's plucking the strings of the heart and it's making, as Hebrews says, the fruit of your lips. I haven't seen any lips on a piano or on a guitar. So. Well, okay. Uh, any other comments? Yes. It seems like the fundamental root problem of all of our differences, and I'm speaking not in terms of between us and other religious groups, but within our own brotherhood, is the prevailing attitude for the Bible. Is the Bible God's word? Is it the final word? Amen. Do we only go by it, or do we maintain our differences and bypass it and still continue on? Good point. All right, I'm going to get this next one in here. That would be it, I think. Another line of reasoning goes like this. Recently, a member of the Church of Christ, who has the instrument, said those who oppose to a cappella singing and worship are sinning. According to this man, the a cappella churches of Christ are sinning because they oppose to tradition. They are unwilling to grow. They are legalistic. They have not considered grace, faith, nor the life of Christ. They have forgotten that Paul was freed by the blood to become all things to all people. What an abused scripture in the Bible. That scripture is probably one of the most abused scriptures that there is. That's me talking. That they were slaves to the word and truly not free in Christ. He went on to say that the true message should be death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Amen. And not the issue of singing. But when you're challenged, by the way, on that, you have to respond to it. We're also told that in Scripture. It's not okay just not to say anything if you're asked about it. He went on to say, I have been freed in Christ and am here today to set you free from your sinful ways. 
Actually, I would say, this man is saying that if you sing a cappella in your worship service, you're sinning. In fact, he's not saying that it's okay to use the instrument or not use it. But rather, this guy is saying that it's a sin if you sing a cappella. As a faithful follower of Christ, am I allowed to walk wherever I decide to go, or do I need to follow the instructions that God gives? I would want to turn that around to that person in a loving, kind way and just say to him, give me one explicit statement. I'm not asking for ten. I just want one explicit statement in the New Testament that gives the authority for the usage of the instrument in the worship service. And by explicit, I mean a precise and clear, fully stated, leaving nothing to question statement. One. I just want one of those. He can't do it because it's not there. Give me one implicit statement in the New Testament for the authority of the usage of the instrument in the worship service. Implicit means not directly stated, but understood or suggested. I don't think he can do that. Give me one approved action in the New Testament. He can't do that. Give me one approved um, action or example from history of the first century where they used an instrument. The historians back at that time when they wrote about the church told us how they worshipped and they sang a cappella. So give me one historical document from the first century that would disprove the use of the instrument or prove the use of the instrument. He's not going to be able to do that. Give me one example or reference in the New Testament for the authority of the usage of the instrument in the worship service. One example. In the New Testament, in the worship service, for the usage of the instrument. Friends, he's not going to be able to do that either. He's not going to be able to to do those things. Wow, I had a whole bunch more to go. Um, I'm trying to defend why we do it this way. I'm trying to use historical records like what I quoted from all of those individuals who didn't used to use it, their religions didn't, but they're using it now. I'm trying to show you from the Bible why we don't use it. I can't give you the answers why the denominational world decided to use it. I can tell you this, not all of them have, I know I'm over time, but not all of us, not all of them have used the instrument. We don't hear much about the ones who haven't, but not all of them have. There's some in the Baptist church who have not gone to the instrument yet. You know, you mentioned Brother Dykes a minute ago. Uh, Mr. Dykes, I'll say. Uh, Mr. Dykes, when he was presenting a lesson one time, and I found this fascinating. He said, and by the way, his mother-in-law is a member of the Church of Christ. And he said... We could save so much money in the Baptist church if we just sing a cappella. <laughs> and I found that to be interesting that a Baptist minister of a large Baptist church would say, would say that. Let's have a prayer. God, thank you so much for the day that you've given to us and thank you for the blessings of this life. Please strengthen and encourage us. Please build us up in your service. We ask that we remain people of the book we ask that we study to show ourselves approved. We ask that whenever we approach an individual uh, who may disagree with us on some things, that we do it with a loving heart, that we try our best to make a stand for you. It's not that we're trying to offend. It's that we're trying to all come to the same understanding. Bless us in that effort, and please build us up in your service. In Christ's name, amen.